Okay, good day, people. Hope everyone is well. I'm going to try to follow up on this Veritasium discussion on, on information. And I don't even know how to do this. There's so much stuff I want to say. And I want to, you know, I, I did do a, a real quick little email exchange with him. And he he kind of said to me, hey, look, you know, we have different definitions of information, which I thought was interesting. You know, it, not, not to be contentious, but it does seem odd sort of ironic to suggest that people can have different definitions of information when one of the definitions of information is that it's independent of observers and of consciousness and of people. It's just has to do with existing relation states in mass and energy. You want to go, well, okay, but delimited by who, you know, assessed and measured by who, you know, Part of it could be raised in sort of spooky dooky ways, which I tried to do a long time ago in asking a very simple question. It, it, it doesn't sound like it makes sense at first, but I tried to ask some of my earlier videos, if you ask a question something like, where and when are words? See, it's, it, um, the question almost doesn't make sense, but if you ask the question, where and when are words, it seems like your first, at first pass, you want to say, well, the words are in the space and time of the organism. I mean, here I am, and the words are occurring within some sort of space and time of this organism, the environment. And yet, the more you think about it, no, the actual where and the when, those are being created by the words. That is, when I start to date if I'm going to date the, the cosmos, if I'm going to try to punctuate the specific moments when the, the words occur, if I'm going to measure them, all of those just require more symbolic apparatus to locate it. So it seems as if when we try to ask even a very simple question like where and when are words, it's not that the words are occurring within the space and time. It's that we're finding ourselves within the space and time that gets articulated by the words. Okay, so th there are all kinds of problems just from the get-go. And they do have to do with context and with delimitation of context. And where does the observer necessarily stand in order to draw the lines that let us say, okay, here are the relations specified and delimited and measurable, and here are the general claims about it. So rather than try to get into all the, I guess, the kind of complex arguments and issues that could go on there, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to respond just really quickly to, and I don't know how quickly I can do it. I wish I could say this is going to be really quick. Uh, I want to get at what I think is sort of the source of this, and then really quickly give a series of exemplars, and maybe I'll try to visualize them, bring in some some edits or something to help to help clarify it, but I want to see if I can really illustrate some of the problems with the way that information has been has been talked about. And if you've seen these videos that Veritasium has done on information, he really is equating information with energy and, and mass. Now, maybe not energy and matter. See, there's this whole contestation over whether matter gets conserved or just mass gets conserved. I think, from my own perspective, the, the problem is that people imagine that information gets conserved. People imagine that information cannot be created or destroyed. This is part of this definition that's sort of being... It's in the backdrop of the of the argument that's being uh, drawn upon and the set of ideas that are being drawn upon as he's giving these videos. And part of it would be that what would need to be the case for his position on information to hold would be that all of the characteristics of energy and matter, everything, would have to apply directly to what we mean by information. That is... If we can identify some characteristics of information that don't directly seem to apply to what we mean by energy and matter or energy and mass, then I think we do start to see why we need to be very careful in our definition and there may be multiple kinds of information and maybe that's part of the problem, but also to be able to say how does information always depend upon material conditions, but how does material reality depend 
factually upon an observer for information states. Okay, so we can sort of get at that. Okay, and okay, let me, let me see if I can just walk through some solid examples. Okay, and here, so here's example number one. We'll call it the guacamole example. Okay, so I have eight students. I have a class full of students, and I have in, they're in rows of like eight or nine students, or maybe 30, 40 students in the class. I select a row, and this is really helpful if you have international students, uh, students of different ages. I mean, a, a whole wide range of, of folks, and different areas of the U.S. All this helpful. You select one row, and you have everyone say the word guacamole. Just write down that row. Each person say it out loud. You know, guacamole, 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 right? And, they, and pe people will do it, eight, maybe nine people. And then you ask everyone, you say, okay, everyone just heard that. You say, how many utterances were given? How many speech moments, how many utterances were said? How many people spoke? Everyone agrees. They all go eight, nine, however many people actually spoke. And I'll say, how many words, how many different words were spoken? And they all go one word. It was the same word. Now, how could it be the same word? There were different rates, different intonations, different pitches, different accents. In fact, there were eight different space-time moments that occurred relative to each other. That is, one happened first, one happened second. One happened the fourth to the second. I mean, you, you can start to do all the division of how there were actually unique space-time events engaged by different people and yet the same word was said. Now, again, different accents, different intonations. Somebody might have mispronounced it and yet how, how could someone hear the word as the same word if it was mispronounced? Now, you might, someone might say, well, well I, you, you're confusing it. No, I would want to hear someone address the issue get exactly at the guacamole problem. Because, again, you know, maybe I'll have to play some of this clip from, well, I think people can see it. I'm going to attach a link to the clip where Veritasium and Vsauce are acting as if words are literally held in the material vibrations that people speak when they give utterances. This, this is incorrect. It's basically incorrect. I mean, that's a, that's a solid... Hopefully, it's a solid example for people. Okay, next example. See, we'll call this the division of substance problem. If words were simply, if words as information, rather than words as code, that is, words as material conveyor of propositions, if they were simply a substance like a piece of matter, then they should they uh, should be subject to principles of divisibility and entropic fragmentation as a result of it. So, if you and I are sitting down and I have an apple and I divide that apple in half, we can each have half an apple. Now, if a third person comes in, we're going to cut the apple and maybe we each cut off a little piece, and you know, all three of us can have the apple, but when people come to hear a, a small talk, if we're in a room and two or three people enter the room to hear the talk, the information of the presentation doesn't get divided by the people who are there. It's not as if there is a, what, a measurable, quantifiable amount of, of mass that the the information has that then gets distributed and divided up amongst the people who hear it, that doesn't make sense. I mean, think of this. Like, imagine someone says to you, okay, let's call this the, the apple problem, sort of related to the divisibility, the division of substance problem, so the apple problem. Some person comes up to you and they say, hey, don't eat any apples. There, right now, is a shortage. There's been a really bad season. It's been a bad crop. The weather's been bad. Don't eat any apples. We're trying to conserve them for whatever reason. Now, you could argue with the person. You might go, well, you know, I, I'm going to eat apples, or, you know, I'll pay more, or whatever. And that would make sense. But if a person would come up to you and go, shh, 
Don't use the word apples. There's a shortage. I hope you go crazy person. You know, this doesn't make any sense to say there's a shortage of a word. Yeah, a word is a principle of repeatability. If a word can't be repeated, it's no word at all. That's why it seems like you can't really destroy information. Because you can't destroy the ephemeral, the, you know, the eidetic identity that shows up across all the different material embodiments. It is, you know, it was literacy that gave the illusion that words were things, that they could just be present as objects in space and be subject to forms of decontextualization. And then the telegraph. I mean, the telegraph really amplified that and got it off the ground. I think, though, going back to this, you know, the apples example, right, that if you say... Take, take the expressions in English. If I say apples are my favorite fruit, and then I say apples is a word in English. Now, why do I change the word apples? I'm sorry. Why do I change the word uh, from the plural to the singular, from are to is, when I move to the word apples? I mean... Certainly, millions and millions of people have used the word, and yet it remains singular. It's unchanged. It seems negentropic. You know, if I have a apple, and I set it on the counter, after a little bit of time, that apple is going to decay. It's going to rot. It's going to have fruit flies and all kinds of other stuff around it. The word apple as a principle of repetition, it doesn't seem to decay. The, you, know, you could tear down all the apple trees in existence, and the meaning of the word apple arguably still exists, at least exists in the minds of those who would know it. Right? So it seems like there is some issue here, and it largely has to do with context. And I think, see, the, the observer gets unnoticed as the contextualizer, as the delimiting factor, as the ground under which various figures of measurement go on. There's always the presupposition of the observer in the backdrop. But, you know, part of it has to do with okay, that, that information is fundamentally about something. Now... And it has to do with, I guess, consciousness itself. Consciousness is, and this is one of the insights of phenomenology, that all consciousness is consciousness of something. That is, consciousness is intentional. And when we say it's intentional, we don't just mean, it's not in the direct sense of intentions, like one intends to do something, but it refers more generally to this aboutness, that when, um, when we talk especially a denotative proposition. When we talk, we talk about something. We make some claim about things, and then we assess whether or not someone said the truth or said the falsity of something. And truth and falsity really is an interesting issue because it, it's truth value and the falsity of information is one of the most important aspects of information. It's why we like information as information. That is, we want true information rather than misinformation or error-filled codes, which are basically, again, a kind of misinformation. And if you ask this question about errors, it's interesting because I don't think you can have an error at the level of matter and energy or mass. There are no errors. Everything always only is what it is. But as soon as, you, as soon as you move to the level of information and you start to talk about information, you're in the realm of errors, of what could be wrong. And it's partly because codes have redundancy in them. I mean, this is seen in everything from severe birth defects that can be noticed because there is enough redundancy in the genetic sequence to have, you know, it's not as if there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between a gene and its expression. There's multiple levels of redundancy all through the, gen through the genome and through the genetic sequence that allows for 
ontogeny and growth and development in a way that's coherent. When an error happens, you can see the error because there was so much redundancy built into the system, both across people and in the individual ontogeny of the organism. Right? There's a difference between genetic variety and error, and this happens when you move to the level of life, to the level of the, the organic. Right? I don't think you find it the inorganic. Okay, but if we go back to this, this question of you know errors. Well, errors can occur because, as I said, there's a kind of an aboutness and a redundancy that's built into information, and I guess it's going to get too complicated for me to go into this question of how do speech genres and context and code. Um, Relate. Maybe I'm going to end with one last example, and then I'm going to maybe try to pick this up in a subsequent video. Okay. One of the if, one of the issues, and it relates to context, is that once contexts have been set up and delimited and understood and routinized and regularized, now absences themselves can be messages. And this is going to pose a real problem for some forms of compositional analysis. That is, some forms of materialist science are really at a loss for how a nothing can be meaningful and can be a piece of information. Because if information is, I guess, if the information has to do with relation states and existing relation states, the problem then is how can a message be sent when no message was sent? See, I think we can, it's, it's easy to try to talk about the, the amount of code that's sent through a wire, but it's different to talk about the way that a pause in interaction has meaning. Or if, if a certain, you know, if a group of people could be a military group on a mission, or it could just be, you know, a couple, if they regularly have a phone call at a particular time, and then one day goes on and that phone call doesn't go on, well, that it's, is its own message. But it's odd to say that there was a message sent when there wasn't one sent. The only way that one could know that one was sent was to have an observer there who's able to contextualize and delimit how that absence was a meaningful absence within that context. All right. I guess more coming. Thanks. Help people uh, jump into this, add examples, uh, criticisms, concerns. Please help uh, Veritasium and others try to come to terms with this issue of what do we mean by information. All right. Thanks.